what's good, 11 o'clock? How we doing, Rocky Peak? Hey, it is good to be with you. Congratulate yourselves. You celebrated your family for another Thanksgiving season. So welcome. Hey, it's glad to be with you. Whether you're here in the worship center, you're joining us over the ridge, especially if you're here for the very first time. Welcome to Rocky Peak. My name is Dre. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm going to lead us in our time of teaching. And I got to tell you, I'm just really excited about the passage that the Lord has got for us this morning. This passage is powerful, and this passage has been challenging me for the last several weeks. So I'm excited to be here this morning to continue to learn alongside of you. So with that, if you open up your programs, inside you've got a green and white message note sheet, which is a great tool to help you follow along. We also provide a lot of blank space for you to be able to have the room to jot down anything the Holy Spirit might be prompting you to remember. I'm going to pray. We're going to dive right in. Jesus, we've gathered here this morning to declare that you are our king. And by declaring that you are our king, what we are saying is that we are submitting to your authority. And the beautiful truth is that by submitting to your authority, we don't miss out on life. But we actually learn the truth of what you said in John's gospel, that you provide the best life possible through relationship. Jesus, by submitting to your authority, we learn to listen and follow. And when we learn to listen and follow, we experience transformation. Through your authority, you transform us to reflect you and your character, Jesus. And so we thank you this morning for the songs in which we've declared who you are. We thank you for the word we're about to open, which is living and active which is going to continue to encourage and challenge us to grow in our transformation. Father, as I often pray as the communicator, let me become much less. This is not about me. Let you as our king, as the Messiah, become the focal point and much, much more. Jesus, you are already speaking. And as your church, we are committed to listening to what you have to say. In your son's name, we all say, amen. So if you're joining us for the first time, I want to take just a few moments to bring you up to speed. This morning, we're going to be continuing the series we've been in for the last several weeks called The Gospel. Now, this series is based on a letter in the New Testament of our Bibles, written by one of the key leaders of the early movement of Jesus, a man named the Apostle Paul. And this letter is specifically addressed to a group of Christ followers that he himself had led to Jesus about 10 to 12 years earlier, living in the ancient city of Philippi, which is now in modern day Greece. And the heart behind the series is that in this letter to the Philippians, more so than in any other letter that we have in the New Testament of Paul's, he uses the word the gospel over and over again. And through this letter, we see that Paul wants Christ followers to understand two things about the gospel. One, he wants us to understand that the message of the gospel is bigger is brighter, is bolder, is more epic than we often see it as being. But secondly, he also wants us to understand what we've been saying every week, that the gospel is much more than a message to be believed, but it is a life to be lived. And so for over the last several weeks, Michael's been up here, and we entered into a new section in our letter. And if you were with us, you saw that Michael unpacked, Paul talked about these two paradigm shifts that happen in the life of a Christ follower. One, this paradigm shift away from viewing this as religion. And secondly, this paradigm shift of embracing that this is a relationship with King Jesus. And so as I usually say, if you've missed any weeks in our series or just want a refresher course, they're always available on YouTube or through the Rocky Peak app because we build on it and it builds context. Now, one thing that Paul did throughout these last two weeks as Michael unpacked those passages is that he often referred to his personal story as an example or a model for Christ followers to follow. And so he's going to continue to do that in our passage this morning. Specifically, he's going to use himself as a model when it comes to our behavior now as Christ followers. The question he's addressing is now that we are in Jesus, how do we conduct ourselves? What is our view and our conduct towards sin? And so if you're following along in your note sheet, you got a section titled, A Model to Follow. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. If you've got your apps, turn them on. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. And as is the norm with me, get your pens ready, get your highlight function ready, because we're going to mark this passage up. 
So Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to be starting in verse 17. The apostle writes, join together in following my example. Would you underline and highlight those, for those three words? Following my example. In fact, would you put a box around it? Flames, highlights, arrows, anything that draws your attention because this is key to what's going to follow it. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, would you underline the word model? Just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live live as we do. Now, let's stop here. There's a lot to unpack in just this opening verse. And so what's interesting is Paul starts off by saying, follow my example. And so to understand what he's really saying, the first thing we need to address is what he is not saying. This is not an ego move on Paul's part. This is not Paul saying, I am superior, I am perfect, I am the religious elite, and you have no hope as to ever being me. So worship me, praise me. This is not fake, real fake righteousness. We know this because of two things. One, we know this because that's not been Paul's heart throughout the entirety of the letter to this point, has it? But secondly, we also know it through the specific language he uses. In the Greek, the word that we have translated as example is a very unique word that literally means joint, joint follower or joint imitator. And so a better understanding with this word used, Paul is saying, imitate me as I also imitate something greater. In fact, he himself sums this up really well in your note sheet in his letter to the Corinthians. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So what the apostle is saying is I'm not perfect, but in my pursuit of Jesus, I have been transformed. And so look at my example as proof that Jesus is and does who he claims to be and what he claims to do. And just as Jesus has changed my life, if you pursue him, he can change yours as well. And think about it, as Christ followers, having models is important because they are living, breathing proof of what God can do in ordinary lives. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I was here with you as we talked about Paul showing other examples. He put up Timothy and Epaphroditus as examples to follow, not because they're perfect, but again, because they were broken men who had been transformed through the power of Jesus. And what I love about Paul's heart is, again, he doesn't hold it just to himself or his team. He says, he be on the lookout for more people who live as we do. Now, that word live is a very key word. Other translations of the Bible translate that word as walk. And that ties this. Paul is linking the Old Testament to the statement. In the Old Testament, someone who was thought of as walking with God meant that they walked in obedience. And so as Paul is saying, follow my example, what he is saying is, now that Jesus has transformed us, follow my example when it comes to behavior, when it comes to conduct, when it comes to how we carry ourselves. And again, this finds precedent in everything Paul has written up to this point, that because of Jesus, Christ followers, we now have a new view and approach towards sin, that because of Jesus, we don't live to be better people in hopes that God will love us, but we've already experienced God's love, and now living better lives, living different behavioral choices in our lives is not out of obligation, but it is the overflow of of joy. And so that's what he's calling us to do. And then he continues, verse 18, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, would you underline the word tears? We're going to come back to that, but you see some real raw emotion that Paul is describing. For as I've often told you before and now, even again with tears, many live as enemies Underline and highlight that word. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. 
meaning that they almost pride themselves on their sin and rebelling against God. And so as we unpack this, Paul is using strong language, isn't he? And that's one thing I truly love about the Bible is say what you will about Scripture, but you can never argue that Scripture is not a blunt book. In fact, when Scripture talks about sin, it uses very clear language. This is not the only time we see Paul refer to people in sin as enemies of Jesus, as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we don't know if Paul is specifically referring to people outside the church who have yet to repent and experience redemption. We don't know if Paul is referring to people within the church walls who may praise Jesus with their words, but their lives don't back it up. Frankly, to me, the language leaves it open to be a both and as we go into this. But what's key is the fact that as Paul thinks of those who have yet to give their lives to Jesus, he is grieved by them. He is grieved that they have chosen a false god. He is grieved that their destiny is destruction. Now we need to take that to heart because one of the traps we can fall into in our Christian communities is view those outside the church. View those that have yet to put their faith in Jesus as automatically being our enemies, as being distant, as saying you've made your bed, now lie in it. You have brought destruction on yourself. But Paul is showing that he is grieved based on their choices. And we need to ask the question, why? Why are they close to his heart? And why is he asking them, why is he asking us to carry them close to our hearts as well? Because Paul is remembering that before he gave his life to Jesus, he was an enemy of the cross. In fact, this is a key thing we all need to embrace as Christ followers. That before you gave your life to Jesus, you were an enemy of his cross. You were an enemy of Jesus. And it's important for us as Christ followers that we have an accurate and a bigger view of what sin truly is. See, often we minimize sin. We view sin as being, well, it's doing bad things or it's wrong conduct. But that doesn't get to the heart of what sin is. In fact, the apostle is writing this because he knows as Christ followers, if we're going to walk well with Jesus, we need to understand the severity and the gravity of exactly what sin does. And to properly define sin, I love the two descriptions that Pastor Michael has used over the last several years. The first is that sin is committing treason against our King Jesus. Sin is completely rebelling against his leadership and his authority because that's truly what we're doing in sin. We're rebelling for a multitudes of reasons, often that we don't trust him to be who he says he is. But the second description Michael uses that goes with that is that sin is pledging allegiance to the kingdom of darkness. When we rebel against Jesus, we are pledging allegiance to the kingdom of the enemy. And so with that, we see why Paul is grieved because he remembers that he once was an enemy deserving of God's wrath. And I want to ask you rhetorically, Christ follower, have you ever seen your life before Jesus through that lens? Have you ever seen your past life as being an enemy of Jesus, an enemy of his kingdom. And so the reason why Paul is grieved is that those in sin, who the Bible may even call our enemies, remember the commands are to love our enemies. The command are to love the world that Jesus loves. And it, becomes, it can become so easy for us to love a people that we feel are, dis to not love a people that we feel are distant or we're not connected to. And Paul is reminding us we are connected to them. They may be enemies now, but we were once enemies as well. And Paul, as he talks about that, the metaphor he uses, their God is their stomach. He uses that elsewhere in the New Testament. What that means is that before we came to Jesus, our top priority was our own happiness. Whatever our appetite demanded, that's what we did. That's what we fought for. All that mattered was me. And where does that lead? Destruction. 
But what's beautiful about this is that when we understand a deeper and bigger view of sin, it automatically informs how much more massive and beautiful the love of Jesus is. Because think about it. Jesus, while we were still in rebellion, while we were unrepentant, while we had pledged ourselves to the other side, entered into our world, entered into our lives, entered into your darkness, entered into your rebellion, entered into your sin to rescue you from it. The truth of sin is grave, but the truth of Jesus is beautiful. In fact, I like how the apostle puts it in Romans 5, there in your note sheet. Since we, have been, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And this is a point we're going to touch on a little bit later, that through that wonderful act of repentance, that is not the end of a story, but is the beginning of a brand new story of your lives, the beginning of a new story that now Jesus is writing as you are a new creation. And so Paul continues to contrast and remind us of who we were, but especially of who we are. And he writes in verse 20, but our citizenship, would you underline that word citizenship? But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior, underline that, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's stop there. I know that I'm stopping in the middle of a sentence, but we need to understand this is powerful language Paul is doing. And to understand why it's powerful language, we need to unpack a little bit of cultural context. See, to Paul's readers at Philippi, the language that he was using was heavily political language. In the ancient world, citizenship was a source of pride. Citizenship could mean where you were born and raised, but more often than not, citizenship, imply, citizenship meant whose, what authority do you submit yourself to? And so by being a citizen of a specific authority, there were privileges that came with that, but there was also a responsibility that you upheld to represent and reflect the character and the value of the authorities you were submitting to. And so in the Roman world, being a Roman citizen was something that was highly revered and it was value because Roman citizenship was not open to all. Rome was the superpower. And so by being a Roman citizen, it indicated that you were better than other people. It indicated that you were part of the elite. This also contextually carried a lot of weight in Philippi. Philippi was a Roman garrison in Greece, yet Caesar Augustus declared that this city outside of Italy should have equality with Italy. It was one of the rare cities that was considered no less than Rome itself. And so for many people living in Philippi, your Roman citizenship defined your identity. And here what Paul is saying using that language is that in the act of repentance, what happened is you became the citizen of a new kingdom, a bigger kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. Christ followers, you are now a colony of heaven on earth. You are now God's commonwealth on this world and you are now called to reflect the values and character of your King Jesus. And as he goes on and he calls Jesus Savior, for us, again, that sounds like common church language, but this was another politically charged statement. Because in the Roman Empire, Caesar was called both Savior and Lord. If you study the Roman Empire, a phrase that comes up is what's called the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. And what that means is that Caesar saved his kingdom, that Caesar brought peace 
to his kingdom. Caesar is Lord. Now think about that. With that cultural climate, if you were part of the early movement of Jesus in the Roman Empire, do you now see the great cost socially, politically that came by declaring that Jesus is Lord and that you are a citizen of heaven? And yet they did it enthusiastically. Because what I love about what Paul is doing is when he calls Jesus our Savior, he isn't just flipping political language. But again, Paul is linking the power of the Old Testament in the truth of who Jesus is. He is using the Old Testament to define this term. That in the Old Testament, when it spoke of the Savior, the Messiah who was to come, It didn't describe Messiah as being the authority over a single region or a single people group. The Old Testament defined Messiah as being the authority over all the cosmos, over the entire universe itself. And so Paul is focusing us on a much, much bigger picture. Think about that truth today. Some 2,000 plus years later, here we are and where is the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire is a distant memory in our history books, but the cross of Jesus is not. Now with that, Christ follower, I need to do an important sidebar. And we need to understand and take this to heart. The Lord has been using this to speak to me and mold me about the current situation and political climate in our country today. See, Christ follower, we believe deeply in having a church that represents all sides of the political spectrum. That if Jesus is going to reach all people, he's going to need Christ followers in all areas. But we also need to acknowledge the reality that our nation is very angrily divided when it comes to our politics. And we need to remember to use these verses to check ourselves that often the source of our anger is that we are placing what only God can do, God-sized hopes and expectations on human shoulders that were never meant to bear that weight. And so remember something, Christ follower, when it comes to politics, be involved. Do your civic duty, but your politicians are not your savior. When it comes to this beautiful nation we live in, it is one of the deepest joys of my life to be able to say that I am an American citizen. I love this nation, but being an American citizen is not what gained me entry into heaven. The death and resurrection of Jesus is what did that. And so let's remember that as we go forward. And so as Paul continues, verse 2, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, would you underline that? Under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And so there's a couple of things that Paul is doing in this. One, he, as he uses the phrase eagerly await, he is once again showing a defining characteristic of the new community of God's family is that we are a people dominated by hope. Dominated in a very real hope in a very real Jesus. And he talks about Jesus' authority over all things, but then he talks about Jesus transforming our bodies. And again, what makes me laugh is Paul is using this to stick it to Caesar. Because in the Roman Empire, Caesar was, thought, Caesar was thought of as having sovereign control over the bodies of all of his subjects. Remember where Paul is physically. He is in a Roman prison tied to Roman chains. All of that is a symbol of Caesar's authority over his body. And yet the apostle is writing that he waits in hope to an even greater power to our Lord Jesus because Caesar did not resurrect Paul's heart. Caesar did not take Paul's body that was broken and riddled by sin and bring it back to life. 
Caesar is not going to one day return as Jesus will and fully resurrect that body. Only Jesus one day will return. Only Jesus will redeem creation, a new heaven, a new earth. Only Jesus will give us what's called glorified bodies, meaning bodies that are like his resurrected bodies. I like how Michael puts it, that Jesus' resurrected body is a preview of coming attractions for us. That is what King Jesus does, and Caesar ain't got nothing on that. And then he finishes this section as we go into chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, and I talked about this a couple weeks ago, Paul does not use family language because it's obligatory Christianese in the church. Paul uses family language because family means something and it matters. This is the new community. The colony of heaven is a new reborn family. And what's important about this is that if we are going to live differently, if we are going to make different choices in regards to sin, it's going to take us doing it together. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm. Would you underline that? Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And often when we hear a biblical command to stand firm, our first reaction can be stand firm against external threats. And that is true in a lot of ways. But looking at the context of the passage we've just been in, this call to stand firm is for us to stand together against the internal threats to our hearts, against sin and what sin can do in our lives. So that's our passage today. And so what I want to do next, something I often do, is I want to pull a couple of truths to examine out of this passage. Specifically, I want to t spend some time unpacking Paul's truth of our identity and because of our identity, how we now view sin. And so if you're following along in your note sheet, you got a section titled, Our Transformed Identity. And your first fill-in is this. Because of Jesus, we are now citizens of heaven. Because of Jesus, we are now citizens of heaven. Let me ask you a question. And this answer is going to vary depending on your background or religious background. What was your emotional reaction the first time you ever heard the word or the concept of repentance? Did you react positively to it or something else? When I first heard of repentance, it scared the daylights out of me. First of all, the word itself sounds epic and kind of spooky, doesn't it? And the idea of repent, what repentance is, the way I understood it, was God or a religious official is pointing a finger at me, telling me how horrible I am. And that repentance is this thin thread separating me from an eternity of damnation. That was growing up my view of repentance. And it's amazing that as I got older and I gave my life to Jesus, I experienced repentance firsthand. And it went from being something that was terrifying to something that is truly beautiful. Think about what happens in the act of repentance. When we go to our knees and we repent to King Jesus, what we're doing is we're renouncing the enemy and sin in our lives. We are renouncing our allegiance to the kingdom of darkness. We are experiencing the forgiveness of a merciful King Jesus. We are being restored by his transformation. We are pledging allegiance to the true kingdom, his kingdom. And in that act of repentance, everything about us has been changed. We are now fully transformed, and as I mentioned earlier, it is now the beginning of a brand new, a much more epic story of your life, one that is now being authored by Jesus himself. And what I love about this transformation is that sometimes we have this Christian misconception that we give our lives to Jesus, he heals us, and the next thing we do is wait until we get to go to heaven one day. But when we understand repentance as the Bible displays it, is we don't wait for heaven one day because through repentance, we have now become a reflection of heaven on earth. 
Jesus brought heaven down to us. So that is what I mean by saying you are now a citizen of heaven. And what I love about this is that when he changes everything about us, he also changes our priorities. If you were here last week, Michael asked a series of four key questions, and the first one was, what is your top priority? And often, as Christ followers, we may think that our top priority is to be better people, is to work out our salvation, is to somehow be more appealing to God. But the reality is that what Jesus has transformed in us is not for us to try to be slightly better people. What Jesus has transformed, our new priority, is to know him more. That is now the priority of the transformed life. That is now the priority of the citizen of heaven, that the top priority is that we know Jesus more. And through that, that is going to affect every area of my life. And by that being the top priority, you better believe that's going to overflow and deeply impact my behavior and conduct. And so with that, that leads me to the second fill-in, the second truth, that because of Jesus, we now approach sin differently. That because of Jesus, we now approach sin differently. A essential way, a core way in which we embrace our new citizenship in the kingdom of heaven is through obedience. Paul has been talking about this throughout the letter. In fact, if you remember back in chapter 2, Paul was diffusing a situation in which the church was arguing and grumbling and falling into that sinful trap. And in response to that, Paul lays out that God's vision for us in chapter 2, he says, is to be blameless and pure without fault. Christ follower, God has an epic view and vision for your life. And that epic vision is that you would be blameless and pure. And to equip you to learn to accomplish that, he has given you himself. He has given you his spirit. He has given you the power which died and rose again, which defeated sin in darkness itself. This is God's vision for your life as citizens in this colony, the kingdom of heaven. And so to embrace that, we need to do more than just have a new, I have to think new ideas. We need a completely new mindset. Again, this is a, a theme that's been coming up in Philippians, that we need to take off the old mindset, the way we used to view and embrace sin, and we need to put on the mindset of Jesus. We need to move away from a mindset that views sin as something that we only dealt with once in our lives. That when I repented and gave my life to Jesus, that was when I dealt with sin and then we're good. But we also need to move away from the mindset that minimizes sin, as we've been talking about, that doesn't see it as a big deal. And by moving away from that, we need to acknowledge that there is a deep temptation in many of our lives as Christ followers to become very accepting of sin in our lives. See, I'm not necessarily talking about the mistakes once in a while or backsliding into something. We see how we've become very accepting of sin in our lives in what we call habitual sins, the sins in which we are regularly engaging, the sins in which we are regularly experiencing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And what happens is when we become accepting of sin, when sin becomes a regular rhythm of our lives, then all of a sudden our view of sin becomes minimized. And not only does our view of sin become minimized, but when it becomes we stop seeing sin as something to be removed because we stop seeing it as detrimental to our lives and we even stop seeing it as detrimental to our walk with Jesus. In fact, a mindset that I have often struggled with that I have come to find in my own life is one of the most dangerous mindsets I can have when it comes to sin is the mindset that when it comes to these habitual sins, it just is what it is. Right? It just is what it is. This is part of me. This is in my life. Nothing's going to change. And we come to that mindset from different places. Sometimes we come to that mindset because we have legitimately tried to deal with these sins in our lives, and it didn't work. And we felt frustration and shame, 
And so in a sense, we conceded and went, well, if I can't deal with this, if I can't fix this, then I guess it's just here. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sometimes we come to this mindset because we found ourselves just justifying it. Well, it's not hurting anyone else, right? Or no one knows about it. It's, it's my secret. Sometimes we justify it by doing a sin scale. I often talk that we like to view our sin through the lens of what's worse, and at least I'm not doing that. That we may sit there and go, well, I'm lying through my teeth to these people, but it's not like I murdered them. So you know what? I'm good. And sometimes we often view the sin scale as, well, look at the victory that I've allowed God to have in my life in these other sins. Those are really good areas. That evens this out, right? Like, that's a B, B plus. Like, I'm good. And as if you look at this passage, do you see any middle ground? No, we don't. And because of this mindset that it could become accepting, even comfortable of sin, then when it comes to these habitual sins, Days go by, weeks go by, years go by, decades go by. And this now is a core part of our rhythm of life. And so as we pause and reflect, we need to remember the heart of the Apostle Paul throughout this entire letter. That if anything is going to change in any area of our life, it is only going to change by focusing our view on the bigness of Jesus. Because if we have a mindset that has become accepting of sin in our lives, the truth is that means we have too low of a view of ourselves and we have too low of a view of King Jesus. I like how he puts it there in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No, <laughs> by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? What Paul is saying through this is understand that by walking away from sin, we walk into an experience of encountering a fuller King Jesus. And so that leads me to the next section I want to cover. How do we deal with our sin? And as you look at that section, here's your filling. The key to removing sin is to worship deeper, not to try harder. The key to removing sin is to worship deeper, not to try harder. And so let me break this statement up in halves. And so this first half, what it means to worship means to know and experience Messiah on a personal level. That we, have ex that we not just have experience, but the, we are regularly experienced that Jesus the Messiah is real, that he is present, that what it means that he is good, merciful, powerful, almighty, loving, all of the amazing attributes that he is. And so understand what we do every week that we gather, whether it's here on the weekend service, whether it's in our life groups when they're in session, whether it's in beautiful things like an ulcer or an encounter, the idea is that your worship does not begin and end with this building. The idea of why we gather as the saints is for this to be a catalyst for you to gain the tools and the ability to then be able to worship in your one-on-one -on -one rhythm of life because it it is in your one-on-one -on -one worship that you will experience the most significant growth, the most significant depth. You will experience the truth of who Jesus is in that worship. And as we worship Jesus, we will experience and having new, deeply held value for our relationship with him. And so we need to see sin through the lens of relationship. Because ultimately, when we sum it all up, what sin does is that it damages our relationship with Jesus. When you value a relationship in your life, you fight for it, don't you? You protect it from harm. 
You shield it from anything that would weaken or damper it. When we learn to truly worship in our one-on-one -on -one lives, we gain such a deeper value for this relationship with our King Jesus that we begin to protect it against sin. Because we begin to understand the reality of what sin is. When we rebel against Jesus, when we don't trust Jesus' character, when we're frustrated because we don't see the provision or the answer or the timetable or he's not giving us the, the, the wants, the desires of our hearts, what happens when we choose to sin is that puts distance between us and Jesus. Not because he goes anywhere, but because we begin to take steps back. And when distance is introduced in a relationship, it saps us of our passion to know Jesus more. And so we need to see this through the lens of relationship, that we are saved through relationship and sin can only be dealt with through relationship with King Jesus. And that leads me to the second half of that statement, try harder. Do you want to know where that phrase comes from? That phrase comes from my own pride. That phrase comes from the times when I have thought that I was the solution to my sin issues. When I have viewed sin in my life and went, okay, I've got to solve this. I've got to remove this. I've got to fix it. So I got to come up with strategies and come up with methods. Now I'm well-intentioned and strategies and methods could be a wonderful thing, but the danger in trying harder is that when I become the focus of my solution, I inadvertently cut Jesus out. And when I try to solve sin on my own, I fail and I experience frustration. Let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever been to Ikea? <laughs> Ikea is a weird place, isn't it? It's this massive Swedish sovereign state inside of our borders. <laughs> and they have to feed you cheaply because it takes hours to walk through Ikea. But one of the reasons why we go to Ikea is because they have good prices on furniture, generally speaking, right? But one of the reasons why they can offer better deals is because part of that gimmick is you have to build it yourself. They're not working any Swedish magic. This is on you. And so several years ago, I went to Ikea and I bought a small entertainment center from my room. Now, as I pulled everything out and I looked at the picture, this wasn't flashy, I'm a simple guy, and there weren't that many pieces. I looked at the pieces, I looked at the picture, I went, you know what? I got this. And I began to assemble this without reading the instructions. Now, if you know me for any length of time, you know that this is something I am not capable of doing. <laughs> but my pride took over, and as you would imagine, this turned into a comedy of errors. Screws and nails were going in places or through things they were not meant to go in or through. I put boards on the wrong side or upside down. It was taking much longer than it should have and I kept getting more and more frustrated because I kept trying to solve this and it didn't work. Finally, I caved and I read the instructions. And it helped me to repair some of the damage I had done. And it led me to actually building it the way God intended for it to be built. <laughs> now let's examine this. What went wrong here? Well, first and foremost, me and my pride. But secondly, my intentions were good. And I knew where I needed to go. But I thought I could do it on my own. And what's interesting is that the support I needed was there the entire time. And I was just too stubborn or blind to see it. And so for us, that's why this is absolutely essential. That if we are going to deal with any sin issues in our lives, it is absolutely essential that we deal with it by first falling deeper in love with Jesus. By first worshiping regularly in our one-on-one -on -one lives. And through that, we will develop a depth and richness of and value of that relationship that we will have a new encouragement, a new motivation, a new strength, and a new passion to protect that relationship from any sin that would want to harm it. I love how the late, great Dallas Willard puts it there in your note sheet. Thus, in Jesus' own ministry, 
He came proclaiming access to the kingdom of God, to God's present care and supervision available to all through confidence in himself. Repent for life in the kingdom of the heavens is now available to you, was what Jesus said. And his presence, actions, and teachings manifested and explained the kingdom. He made disciples by presenting them with the kingdom and introducing them into it by reaching their hearts. Now remember, biblically, the heart was understood as the command center of the entire body of your thoughts and actions, by reaching into their hearts, by changing their vision of reality and their intentions for life. Family, we are never going to out-effort sin. But through a relationship of, with Jesus, we will definitely out-worship it. And so with that, I want to draw our attention back several weeks ago that Michael, through this series, introduced what I felt was a really powerful metaphor that we've been using since then to look at our lives. If you remember, he introduced this metaphor that your life is a big house with multiple different rooms. And each one of these rooms represents a different facet or area of your life. And also, these rooms can represent a different area of sin, a stronghold that the enemy may have. And if you remember, Michael taught us that when Jesus comes to flip the house, so to speak, he doesn't do the entire house at once. But instead, he goes room to room, taking one room at a time, cleaning, renovating, remodeling, until it is made brand new in his image and then moves on to the next. But something powerful he said when he introduced that metaphor is that we all have to admit that there are certain rooms in which Jesus wants to go in and we throw ourselves in front of the door and we say, no, not this room. You cannot come in. And if you remember, as Michael explained this, Jesus does not force his way into that room. Instead, Jesus will patiently go and sit in the living room and wait for you to be ready. Christ follower, I want to ask you rhetorically right now. When it comes to the rooms you're holding off on. When it comes to the rooms you're throwing yourself in front of, is this passage today, is God's word your turning point? Will you let God's word permeate your soul and say, okay, I'm ready for Jesus to go into that room? Will you let the word speak to you this morning to be able to go into the living room? Now, by being ready to go in the living room, that does not mean that you're not scared. That does not mean that you don't have doubts. That does not mean that you're even enthusiastic about all of this. But you are taking God at his word and you are trusting his pattern. Are you ready to go into the living room and say, Jesus, it's time for you to go into that room? And if you are, what I want to do as we wrap up our time is I want to give you two practical steps of how to let Jesus into that room. And so the first step is this. We need to bring sin to light. We need to bring sin to light. It means we need to call it what it is. It means we need to stop hiding it. It means we need to stop ignoring it. We need to stop trying to move on because we didn't get caught. Or these people around me don't know about that. And first and foremost, it means that we need to go before the presence of King Jesus and we need to call it out and say, this is an area of sin in my life. And as I've wrestled with this many times in my life, I understand that for many of us, that's a hard ask to even admit that, right? But I want to encourage you in two ways. One, Jesus already knows. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus already knows what's in that room. Jesus already knows the deepest, darkest, most secretive part of you. Jesus has already heard the worst, most horrific thoughts you have ever had in your life, and Jesus still died for you. He took it, and he nailed it to a cross. And the other encouragement is that he already knows, and he does not want us to bring it to light so that he can then shame us but so that he can free us from that guilt and shame. Look at these scriptures on your note sheet, first from the Psalms in the Old Testament, that I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. The next verse from 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the act of freedom. Now, I do need to mention one other thing, is that by going before Jesus and bringing sin to light, we are submitting to Jesus' authority in this area. And so what that means is that Jesus will speak and lead us in other areas to deal with the sin. And we need to be willing to go wherever our king leads. And for some of us, Jesus may lead us to take an even scarier step, which is confessing that sin to other people. Whether it's people in the church community that can help walk with us, or it may be people that our sin has hurt or has damaged. And often for many of us, we fear confessing our sin because we fear of the consequences. I know in a room this size, some of us are thinking, if I confess to my spouse that I've been cheating on them, if I confess to my loved one that I'm deeply addicted to pornography, if I confess to my work that I've been lying and stealing, if I confess to my friends that I have been lying through my teeth when it comes to them. There may well be consequences, but hear me very clearly. Where the Lord calls you is where he will lead you and go with you in his strength. Your character has much more eternal significance than any momentary consequences. Your character has much more eternal significance than any momentary and admittedly painful consequences. The power that conquered sin and death goes with you to lead you to a new place of freedom. And that leads me to the second practical step, is to walk with a community. Sin is dealt with through relationship, first and foremost through our relationship with Jesus. But the church family what Paul valued this new community is a gift that Jesus gives us to be able to walk through this together because there is strength and safety in numbers, doesn't it? I heard somebody say this years ago, and I love it, to describe the church, that the church is not meant to be a museum for the perfect, but a hospital for the broken. We're here to gather together as people that have been broken by sin and together to find healing and freedom in the name and power of Jesus. And sometimes we fear, what if people knew the real me? What if people knew I didn't have it all together? What if people knew that I've committed sin and awful things in my life? Well, Jesus knows and he still died for you. And as a Christ follower, as somebody who has experienced an undeserved radical grace, as a church brother and sister, it is my opportunity and privilege to show that grace with you as well. And we need each other to do this right. Now, there's a couple different practical ways you can do this in the life of Rocky Peak. One of the key ones you hear us talk about so often, our heart is in life groups. We are a church of life groups. We just ended a session of life groups in January. We're going to be kicking off a new one it is where we shrink this church down into a smaller group of adults. And that's key because life group is an opportunity where we can be known and we can get to know our brothers and sisters. Life group is an opportunity where we can say, I am struggling, I am having a hard time and find not just encouragement and prayer, but people to walk and do life with us. And so I always wanna highly encourage you. I don't know where I would be without the experience of life group. And so I want to encourage you to do that. But there's a second community that has done such powerful work of walking with people who have been hurting, who have had sin be such a hook in their lives for a long time. And this community has been faithful and led people to Jesus' triumph many ways over the years. And that's a community at Rocky Peak called Celebrate Recovery. Now, a lot of you may not be aware, but Celebrate Recovery is a ministry that meets every Thursday night at 6.30. And what I love about those faithful saints is they are there for people who feel like sin has just got these hooks deep in my life. I don't know how this is going to be tailed with. I don't even believe for myself. And Celebrate Recovery points to the power of Jesus. And what you have in Celebrate Recovery are living, breathing models that Jesus 
Jesus can take even the most broken and lead to a place of beautiful healing. In fact, I want to share with you their own mission statement. Celebrate Recovery is a program to help those struggling with hurts, habits, and hangups by showing them the loving power of Jesus Christ through a recovery process. Celebrate Recovery has small groups for chemical dependency, sexual issues, food addictions, eating disorders, codependency, anger, domestic violence, same-sex attraction, and more. And so Christ followers, if you feel that there has been a habitual sin that has just gotten its hooks deep in you, if you wonder, is there any hope for ever experiencing freedom or even taking a step towards experience freedom, I want to highly encourage you and invite you to go and be part of the community at Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights. If you want to gain more information on our website, there's more details as well as these beautiful stories of the way that God has transformed specific people that are in leadership there. And secondly, you can stop by the starting point on your way out, and they can give you some more information about when they meet, how often they meet, and other questions you may have. But as we wrap things up, as I invite the worship team to come on out, we have been called to a new life. And what's beautiful, again, is how we get there. We don't out-effort the sin in our lives, but we do out-worship it. Our behavior is impacted through our hearts becoming purified by the work and power of Jesus. And so Christ Follower, as we go into this final song, it's a song that we have sung many times at Rocky Peak. It's a powerful one. And specifically, we chose it because there's a line that we repeat over and over in which we say, take this heart and show it how to beat. And understand, you are telling God to take everything about you and asking him to show us how to make it pure and blameless. And when we come to God with humility, he answers And so as I say often as we go into these times of worship, don't just let it be words that your mouth mouth says. Let it be the declaration of your soul. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that we don't out-effort sin, but we do out-worship it. Thank you that you have already conquered our sin, our deepest held sin, our most vile sins, Jesus. You nailed it to a cross. You died for it. You rose again. You bore its penalty so that we could no longer have to so that we can live in freedom. And so, Father, as we go into this time, as we receive our tithes, our gifts, and offerings, as we declare, Jesus, take this heart. We mean it. It is our declaration. Jesus, we are citizens of heaven. We are part of a new commonwealth. Take this heart and show it how to beat. Show it how to reflect who you are. Show us the hope, not shame, that comes in confessing our sins with you, Father. Let this be a powerful declaration from a growing church. We love you, Jesus. In your son's name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand together, Rocky Peak.